do you work in or around the co-location data center or wholesale data center industry? Do you sell or partner with wholesale or co-location data centers? Are you in a marketing sales business development products, customer success or executive role? If so, then you'll definitely want to check out this recording from a webinar that we held a little while back so you can learn how co-location data centers can accelerate inbound revenue generation. When you watch this webinar recording, you're going to learn how co-location data centers and their partners face a variety of interrelated challenges, including growth, expansion to new markets, creating new opportunities, positioning, business development, marketing, brand awareness, lead generation, sales, and building the bottom line. In the course of this webinar recording, you're going to get answers to some of the biggest questions on lead generation, obtaining new clients, brand recognition and competitive differentiation, website and social media best practices, and much more. If you find value from this content, make sure that you like this video and subscribe to the channel and ring the bell so that you too can be notified when we release new videos just like this. So the first part we're going to start with is getting found early enough in the right context to matter. Now, what we hear so often from sales managers, marketing managers, and business development directors, and even CEOs in this space is that every single deal comes down to price. And we hear these words pretty much verbatim. Every single deal comes down to price. The frustration boiling over is, I can never get in early enough to explain our real value. And we hear frustration boiling over to the point of this totally sucks. It's no fun when the only thing that you're able to get people to pay attention to at the tail end of the sales cycle, because that's when you first met them, is your price. And that's not a good place to be. And we're going to be talking about today how you can completely change what you're doing and make sure that you are getting in there early enough to explain your true value, to be perceived as an educator, to be perceived as helpful, to be perceived as a thought leader. Where does this all start? It starts with understanding the buyer's journey. And the buyer's journey is very, very different today than it was as little as five or 10 years ago. Back in 2005, marketing did lots of things like trade shows, print advertisements and trade journals and magazines, a lot of postal direct mail and a lot of renting lists and sending email to the people on those lists even if they didn't want to get your emails. And we know the four letter word that describes that kind of email. Um, what also jump started the buyer's journey, the sales process early on about 10 years ago was a lot of cold calling. And then about 10 or 20% into the buyer's journey, 10 or 20% into the sales cycle, prospects were ready to speak with your sales team. Way back then it was a very different relationship between your prospects and your sales department. Buyers were largely at the mercy of your sales team. Sales controlled access to almost all information. There was tremendous, tremendous asymmetry. It was really, really lopsided. Marketing could be totally unaccountable, and in a lot of cases it was, but it didn't matter that much. It was also a very seller-centric sales cycle. Fast forward to today. Marketing still doing a fair amount of trade shows, still doing a teeny amount of print ads. That has largely fizzled away. A lot of the trade publications either disappeared or are a skeleton of what they, of what they once were. Direct mail still kind of sort of there. Uh, the idea of renting mailing lists and spamming the heck out of people is still alive and well. Um, it's amazing it's still alive and well. Google just filed a patent a couple days ago that put another nail in the coffin with that, being able to tie email reputation to to your ability to, to rank in search engines, but you know it still is to a certain degree in the Colo data center space a practice that's being done. Um, however, what's very different about today is your prospects are no longer going to speak with your sales team early on. They're much more empowered. They have a lot more research ability. They can get a lot more information. So when you look at prospects being ready to speak with your sales team when anywhere from 57 to 70 percent, sometimes as much as 80 or 90 percent of the buyer's journey is over, it's a completely different ballgame. And what's caused the disruption of this traditional playbook? The rise of search, the rise of social, the explosion in mobile, and cloud. Huge, huge disruption. Those four factors alone for uh, changing the entire dynamics of the sales process. So at this stage now, sales needs to get found much earlier in the buyer's journey so it can plant its seed in the, in, the, uh, in the ground, plant the flag in the ground. And marketing has a lot more control over sales paychecks than a lot of sales professionals realize. 
because so much of the education, so much of the resources, so much of that thought leadership is happening in the first 70 percent of the of the journey. So uh, the way sales is changing, sales needs to get found much earlier and be perceived as trusted advisors. It's a very buyer centric sales process. It's completely turned uh, the whole funnel on its head. The sales monopoly on information is long gone. And now most of your prospects expect that your sales professionals can deliver a highly personalized, highly customized conversation, more of a consultation than a static pitch. This is a complete, complete game changer and it's really, really important to realize that this is not the future, this is the present and this is the present that's existed for the last two or three years. Let's, let's fast forward now into what it's going to look like one to three years out from now. One to three years out from now, sales and marketing departments as separate siloed departments will disappear. They will be forced into working together as one solid revenue team. We're already seeing this happening. Even in my own network of Colo data center sales and marketing professionals, we've seen two of these things happen just in the past couple months where a marketing manager was promoted to director of sales and marketing and a sales professional was promoted to VP of sales and marketing. So you're seeing that get unified. So there's one person that's totally responsible for revenue and making sure that marketing is working on activities that grow the revenue. So everyone's aligned around the same revenue quotas. Now marketing one to three years out from now will own 70 to 90 percent of revenue generation. 70 to 90 percent of that buyer's journey of that sales cycle will be over by the time your prospects are ready to engage. What's Adding even more gasoline to that, podcasting is going to become a lot more mainstream. You're going to see people actually listening to podcasts in cars a lot more easily as the technology in the big automakers is going to make that more enabled. Uh, video is going to grow even more than it is right now. Live video, Meerkat, and, uh, and Periscope and things like that are going to continue to grow. Personalization is going to become even more important. And at this stage, one to three years out from now, uh, the sales professionals that have survived as order takers and the sales professionals that have survived as explainers are going to go away. Um, the ones that are going to remain are going to have, truly have to be consultants, are going to truly have to be thought leaders, and that is who will dominate the sales profession for co-location data centers. Is your leadership in denial about what's changed? Are they burying their head against the sand? Here's a basic keyword tool showing how many people a month in the US are searching for the phrase data center 8100 now for a lot of people that are listening to this your website may not necessarily have the authority with Google to be able to um, make sense to go after a, a term that's so broad typically you'd go after something a little bit longer a little more specific and have a better chance of being able to work up to that but there's an enormous enormous amount of demand out there for people searching for these terms and remember if you don't get found in those first 10 results if you don't make it to page one either organically or on a paid basis if you're not able to crush your important search terms you may not even you know, it doesn't even pay to show up so getting found before that 70 percent point the moment of truth here is critical to competing in today's co-location data center market the way to do so is by investing in creating at scale helpful original remarkable content this is what's going to lead to true differentiation as we get into more of the Q&A section of today's webinar you're going to see that trend coming up over and over again as a challenge and a frustration among biz dev and sales and marketing and executives in the color data center space is the struggle to differentiate and it, it's not a matter of you saying that you're differentiated your buyer personas your ideal clients that you're going after must agree that you're differentiated it's like going out to shop for a car and the car salesman saying trust me I'm honest Come on. You can't, you're not the one who gets to decide whether you're differentiated. It's the marketplace that your ideal buyers that you're going after that make that decision. So the question is, is your company on board or living in 2005? Okay, the next section uh, moving on on our agenda is creating scalable, predictable revenue growth. And as we can see from our next slide here, um, for a quote from W. Edwards Deming said, in God we trust all others must bring data. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty powerful stuff here. Um, and the way we break down revenue acceleration, sales cycle acceleration, is into four distinct phases. Attracting, converting, closing, and delighting. How to attract the right strangers to your website and turn them into visitors. How to convert those visitors into leads. How to close those leads into clients. 
and how to delight clients into promoters and evangelists so they fuel the cycle and bring you more strangers. It's absolutely critical that you are showing up in all boxes on this. A lot of times I use the baseball analogy for those of you that might be uh, fans of baseball. And if you think about the players that typically go out on a baseball field, you have your outfield, you have your infield, you have your pitcher, you have your catcher. And the story I use a lot is, say for example, the Yankees showed up in Boston at Fenway and the Red Sox had all 25 of their players ready to go, but for some reason only two players from the Yankees showed up. What would happen to the Yankees' chances of winning? They'd be completely decimated, right? It doesn't matter. They could have their best starting pitcher, they could have their best catcher, their best position player, but, but if they only have two players and the, other, and the other team is covering all nine positions on the field and has another 16 ready to go in reserves between the dugout and the bullpen, it's very, very difficult to compete. Along the same lines, if you're not covering all of this, if you're just doing a little bit in the attract phase of worrying about getting visitors to your site and you don't have good uh, conversion paths that are optimized for your ideal clients, if you don't have conversion paths that are optimized to get people to re-engage when they're further along in, in the sales cycle, it's going to be a problem. If you haven't thought about what it's going to take to uh, convert and close more of those leads into clients, it's going to be a big problem. If you haven't thought through a strategy for how to delight your clients, because in a recurring revenue-based business like most Colo data centers are, let's face it, it's not about getting them signed up. It's about making sure that they're happy so they stay. And so they eventually may, ups, they be, may be able to upsell. You may be able to cross-sell. And eventually a small percentage of them will become your promoters and evangelists. The, the flip side is if you completely drop the ball, they become negative evangelists, negative promoters. And in the age of Yelp and Amazon and Google reviews and things like that, that's a dangerous proposition too. So if you want to focus on creating scalable, predictable revenue growth, we have to keep all four of these boxes in mind. Remember, people buy from people that they trust. Can't overemphasize that enough. The moment of truth for kind of self-evaluating all of this is to look at your own website. Start with your homepage and look at does your website content talk more about your company, your services, your stuff, your locations, your compliance, or do you talk about the problems that you solve from your clients? Are you looking at from the perspective of the, the two or three or four different kinds of ideal buyers that you really want to be targeting and attracting to your website? Big tip to think about is during that first 57%, 60%, 70%, 90%, the early stages of that buyer's journey, which is a big, big percentage of the buyer's journey today, during this first 70% or more of the buyer's journey, even your best prospects won't give a you-know-what about your services until you have established trusted advisor status with them. That is such an important mindset shift that's so critical, and we see so many colo data centers completely dropping on the ball on this where nearly all of the content that's on their home page, nearly all the stuff that they're sharing on, on social media is kind of me, 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 salesy, self-promotional stuff. It's not providing helpful educational content. It's not providing resources that are valuable in the eyes of the small sliver of the market that you want to stand out as the best teachers in the world, as the best communicators in the world about what it is that you do. So now moving on to uh, section C here is your biggest questions about growing your co-location revenue. And we put together a word cloud. We took your questions and we grouped them into a word cloud. And, and these are some of the words that we saw over and over again. Colo, clients, differentiate, seen, small, big, new, small, website. So it looks like from what we can tell, co-location providers are looking to differentiate themselves from others. And a lot of what a lot of the questions we got also were on how small small colo providers are competing with the larger colo providers. So secondly, we grouped together um, the questions based on where they are in the buyer's journey. So we're going to start with the attract phase of the buyer's journey. And our first question here is, how can we reach the right prospects in our business development programs? That's an excellent question. How can we reach the right prospects in our business development programs? It starts with understanding who those prospects are and making sure that you understand them so well that you understand them better than any other direct or indirect competitor on the planet. Bearing in mind that when we're talking about creating helpful resources and helpful content that attract people to our site, the obvious competitors may not be the only competitors. In other words, if you're creating content that's also covered in trade publications, 
uh, whose topic is also covered in trade publications, if you're creating content whose content is also covered at trade shows, that's also covered in channel programs, or, or content around certain brands, your direct competitors are not the only people that you're competing for attention, that you're competing for eyeballs with. So it's really, really important to be super specific about the kinds of ideal buyers that you want to attract. And this starts with developing buyer personas. It's a, a buyer persona is a semi-fictional representation of your ideal client or one or more ideal clients one at a time and their goals, their plans, their challenges, their pain points, what's keeping them up at 2 o'clock in the morning, what are some of the things that can get them promoted at work, what are some of the things that if they screw up could get them fired at work, where they hang out online, where they hang out offline, what they secretly desire the most from a colo data center like yours, what they're searching for on search engines, what they're doing on social media. And when you start to see commonalities among people that you look at, you start to realize that they can be bucketed together into a single buyer persona. So reaching the right prospects starts by investing in doing some serious, well thought out, research based buyer persona development. And then that'll fuel things like keyword research, that'll fuel your editorial calendar, that'll fuel deciding what kind of premium content develop that's going to go behind landing pages. So our next question is, what are the most important website best practices for a data center? What are the most important website best practices for a data center? Uh, first and foremost, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, buyer personas are absolutely critical. Second biggest thing is to focus on, even before you get to buyer personas, is identify goals of what you're trying to achieve on your website. We call these SMART goals, the acronym SMART, um, which stands for Specific, Measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. The goal has to be specific, like you want a certain amount of qualified leads each month, or a certain amount of sales opportunities each quarter, or a certain amount of new clients generated within the next 12 months by a certain date. So it's got to be a specific goal. It's got to be something that you're able to measure. It needs to be attainable based on your past history. It needs to be relevant to the overall mission that your marketing and sales team combined, your revenue team combined is going after, and it must be time bound. Everyone can make wild predictions of what they want to do in the future, but unless you assign a deadline to it, how are you going to know if you're actually making progress or if you ever reach that? If you talk to someone that's ever gone on a weight loss program, for example, they say, I want to lose 20 pounds. That's awesome. By when? And the by when is what makes all the difference because everyone can always say, oh, I want to run the marathon. Okay, cool. Are we talking about trying to run the marathon in six months? or in six years, because that can make an enormous difference for how aggressive you train. So focus on setting goals, focus on buyer personas, and make sure that your website is concentrating on being a helpful educational resource for the ideal clients that you want to attract. If your homepage is doing things like advertising the price of your services, or advertising discounts or something like that, almost like an e-commerce almost like an e-commerce kind of site, there may be something majorly wrong with your strategy. The next question, what are the most important social media best practices for a data center, Josh? Social media is an interesting animal because a lot of people take what they know from their personal lives and they try to apply that to their what they're doing from a, a marketing perspective for their, their colo data center. There's an acronym called HIPPO, H-I-P-P-O, like the kind of like the hippopotamus, highest paid person opinion or highest paid person in the organization like the CEO comes in one day and the CEO says we gotta do better on Facebook my 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 teenager is all over Facebook we're getting our butt kicked on Facebook well the, the real answer is when you do those buyer persona when you develop the buyer personas and you figure out who are the two or three or four types of most important people that you wanted to be developing content around are they using Facebook professionally or are they using it for another purpose? What we find in the Colo data center space is, yeah, everyone has Facebook, but most of the time they're sharing personal things on it. They're talking, they're sharing pictures of their kids, their grandkids, where they're going on vacation, a home renovation project, a great recipe, uh, a great deal, a new movie, a concert, things about their favorite sports teams. They're, they're talking about political issues, things that really, really are quite different than what they want to share professionally. What we tend to see over and over again for Colo data centers is Twitter and LinkedIn seem to be the go-to channels. All of this needs to be validated, though, because your buyer personas may be a little different. And even within some of those go-to channels, 
the slices, the strategy, the topics, the themes, the groups that you go after, the hashtags you go after are going to be completely different. Also, don't overlook that with the rise of multimedia content and video content that YouTube and uh, SlideShare can be enormously powerful. And again, before you make heavy investments in those, you want to validate that your buyer personas are there because let's face it, you could do stuff on Vine and Instagram and Snapchat and things like that too. And maybe the children or grandkids of, of your ideal buyers are there. But again, but the, all of your investments with social media should be validated by understanding who your buyer personas are and where they're hanging out online. So the first best practice is know where and why. Second is make sure that you're sharing helpful, relevant content. A lot of people in the Colo Data Center space are selling a lot of, uh, sharing a lot of salesy, self-promotional kind of stuff um, that really is only relevant to people who already know who you are. Uh, that might be leads or late stage opportunities. If you're trying to attract strangers to your website that have never heard of your company before, they're really not going to care about you winning the Employer of the Year award. They're not going to care about how much square footage you've just taken over, and they're sure as heck not going to be interested in your 20% off sale on your on your racks this particular month. So make sure that you're sharing helpful educational content that has more u universal, broad-based appeal. If you think about like the three stages most people go through, awareness consideration, decision-making, and that really, really early awareness stage, they're doing research on broad-based problems. They don't really even, they haven't even really totally defined what their problem is yet. They just kind of have some symptoms. And it's only when they're in the middle of the journey, the consideration stage, where they're start going to be, they're going to start being in a position to compare different solutions and look at different calculators and ROI things and, and uh, grids and attend webinars and things like that. Um, and the late stage is like when they'd request a quote or request a tour. All too often, most Colo data centers are just focused on on that late stage. So really, really important to know your buyers and really, really important to have the mindset of being a teacher, being a professor, providing helpful educational content to attract the right strangers. So next, how can we drive more people to our co-location data center website? How can we drive more people to our Colo data center website? I think the number one mistake we see people make is Remember the baseball movie? It was in the late 80s, early 90s with uh, Kevin Costner and um, James Earl Jones, If You Build It, They Will Come, um, Field of Dreams. <laughs> that kind of sort of worked in the early days of the web in the late 90s. There is such intense competition for people's eyeballs now. There's, such, there's so many things that are competing for not just, and there's so many screens people are looking at in a given day, their desktop, their notebook, their tablet, their phone, their TV, their watch, there's so many different things going on around them that you have to try really, really hard to come up with stuff that's super relevant and make sure that you have a strong distribution plan. So real simple guideline to keep in mind is to balance your efforts between creating content and promoting content or what's sometimes called distributing content. And if you're saying, okay, you know, I have X amount of dollars or X amount of hours, I need to make sure that I spend half creating the content and half literally coming up with a plan that gets it in front of the right people. Maybe it's uh, with the right hashtags, maybe it's the right frequency and repetition, maybe it's the right balance between text and visual content, maybe it's doing some repurposing of content, maybe it's the right LinkedIn groups, but you really, really need to make sure that you don't just put it out there and hope they come. Otherwise, that's like a, a friend or neighbor opening up a restaurant in a strip mall in the middle of nowhere, and it can be the most fantastic restaurant on the planet. But if there's no other restaurants in that strip mall and nobody knows they exist, they're probably not going to be in business very long. It's the same thing with your content. Half on creation, half on promotion. Next question, how can we differentiate ourselves from our competition and be seen? Yeah, I mean the differentiation is a theme we kept seeing over and over again in these questions. And the first thing with thinking differently is to bear in mind that when you look at what most of your local and regional and national competitors are doing, they're kind of doing the default configuration, which right now the default con configuration is they talk a lot about their locations, they talk a lot about their services, they talk a lot about their awards and, and their people. And the reality is when you look at their blogs, they're blogging once a month. If you look at how many calls to action they have that are leading to premium content behind landing pages, it's just a handful. Um, so they're severely, severely under-investing. Um, that's not to say everyone is doing it. There's definitely a good 25, 35% of the market that's doing anywhere from a 
pretty good job to totally crushing it in this area. But if you really want to differentiate yourself from your competition and be seen, um, you know, a lot of the a lot of people wrote it on their Q and A that they're concerned that they have very similar kinds of services and it's tough to to stand out from the crowd. And one of the best ways to do this is to make a serious commitment to being the best teachers on the planet that explain and teach and educate about what it is that you do best. And all the subject matter experts in your company, and some of them may be in sales, some of them may be in marketing, some of them may be system engineers, some of them may be working in your NOC, some of them may be facilities people, some of them may be project managers. But chances are a lot of there's a lot more people within your company that can share their expertise and uh, Q&A and kind of FAQs on what they get on a regular basis than you're currently figuring out a way to get into your strategy, to get into your content, to get into your educational material. And one of the fastest ways to be able to differentiate is to be perceived as the definitive go-to source for education on your topic and your specific verticals you're going after and your local markets, whatever is most relevant to your buyer personas. So next we're going to move into your questions in the next section of the buyer's journey, which is convert, where we're going to take our website visitors and convert them into leads. So our first question here is, how should we be generating leads and obtaining new clients for our data, data center? How should you be generating leads and obtaining clients for our data center? Well, I don't want to take anything for granted, so I still see a certain amount of, co of people in the data center space and the colo space that are actually buying leads from lead brokers, lead services, and things like that. And the problem with that approach is th those leads, with air quotes around leads, are not expecting to hear from you. So when they do hear from you, do they find it helpful or do they find it harassing? Yeah, that's a big one too. They do, do they hit the spam button? Um, and there's a block function in Twitter. There's a there's an equivalent to that in LinkedIn. And we're really, really not very far away from our smartphones having a button just like that also, where you're not only rejecting the call but putting them on an SHI, you know, putting them on a, a bad dudes list of, uh, of people. As we see that already happening on the web, where you go to go to Google and you put in a phone number, and you can see all the reports of of annoying, harassing calls. So this is a cultural shift. This is a mindset shift of if your company is going to exist and pretend like it's still 2005 and harass the heck out of people and interrupt the heck out of people and hope to get a very, very small sliver of a decreasingly small pie of people that put up with that nonsense and actually engage. But it's not the right context in most cases to get trusted advisor status. So the first thing to recognize is that Buying leads and spamming people is vastly different than creating your own proprietary thought leadership content and generating your own leads. If it's a given that we want to generate our own highly qualified leads and we're doing the right things with setting smart goals and we're building our buyer personas and we're being smart about our keyword research and being realistic about the competition that's there, uh, for the basics of generating leads, you want to make sure that you have landing pages and premium content for, that are different for each of your buyer personas. The CFO of a financial services company has different types of issues they're grappling with than the sales director of a SaaS company or the chief operations officer of a media company. So depending on who you're going after, you want to make sure that you have lead generation content, premium content that is specific to that buyer persona. Second is you want to make sure that you have lead generation premium content offers that are relevant to where they are in the buyer's journey, the awareness stage, the consideration stage, the decision-making stage. It's completely inappropriate to throw a request a quote or request a tour offer in front of someone on their first visit to your website because less than 5-10% of the people that are visiting your website are at the stage where they're ready to buy immediately. And if you're not sure why that would put someone off, think about going in to test drive a car and you walk into a showroom and the car salesperson, and you say, I'd like to uh, see some of your models, maybe go out for a test drive. And the salesperson's response is, that's awesome. Are we buying or sell? Are we buying or leasing today? And you say, no, 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 you don't understand. This is the first time out I'm looking. I just want to compare some models and maybe test drive one or two of these. Oh, that is so cool. Are we buying or leasing today? 
and they just they're not listening to you at all so it's really really important to make sure to understand the sales cycle length and the milestone and the journey that your uh, qualified leads go through on the journey from qualified leads to sales ready to, to opportunities and ultimately to clients and make sure that you have premium content that's appropriate for that stage things like white papers checklists ebooks are, are great early on when they're doing research and the middle maybe ROI calculators case studies um, comparisons uh, webinars similar to this and towards the end where you'd have more uh, intimate one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversations where tours uh, needs assessments consultations things along those lines uh, request a quote if you only have things that are for the late decision-making stage you're leaving a ton of money on the table and that's one of the one of the most powerful ways to generate more leads and highly qualified leads is to make sure that you have premium content and landing pages for each buyer persona on each stage of the journey our next question is and you probably touched on some of this with your last one, but how should we go about lead generation finding these new clients? Yeah, absolutely. That's an excellent question. And as, as we touched on a little earlier with the answer to one of the questions, as you'll see up there on the screen, SMART goals are critical. S-M-A-R-T. Specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. Everyone can say, I want more leads, I want more clients, I want more revenue. How much more? Because once we understand how much more, we can build a plan backwards to, to go, taking the funnel in reverse and see, okay, this is how much revenue we need. This is the average deal size. What's the conversion rate from, from opportunity to closing those deals? How many sales ready leads do we need to get to those many opportunities? How many marketing qualified leads do we need to get to those sales ready leads? And how many website visitors do we think we need? So you're working completely backwards in the funnel once you have an idea of what some of those goals are. And just like when you're growing up and you're in school and you have like a three month project and you break it down into milestones, or for those of you that have been project managers at some point in your career where you take a massive project and chop it up into back in the day um, something like Microsoft Project, more currently maybe it's something like um, Trello or, um, or Jira or Basecamp or something like that where we take something and we chop it down into dozens or hundreds of different parts. It's the same th kind of thing with your goals. So you want to make sure that you have goals that are specific to each stage of the funnel. You need to make sure that you have the right technology platforms in place to measure those. They should be attainable based on resources and past history. They obviously need to be relevant to the overall mission of what your company is trying to achieve. And one of the most important parts is the T, the time bound part. We must have time related deadlines to this. Otherwise, it's just a fiction, it's just a pipe dream, and it's really, really hard to go about improving your lead generation and going about finding new clients. But you know, once those goals are in place, set out to do your buyer persona research, and the buyer persona research will inform everything that you do going forward with your premium content offers and everything that you're going to do on social media, everything you're going to do on blogging, if you're doing any kind of paid promotion on search or, or paid social or things along those lines. Now as we, uh, we're going to move again through the buyer's journey to the close phase where we're taking our leads and we're turning them into customers. So our first question in this section is, how can we bring in more sales to our co-location data center? And as you said before, are people buy from people they trust? Absolutely. Um, so one of the most important ways to bring in more sales to your co-location data center is recognize that a huge percentage of your qualified leads will buy at some point, but they're not ready to buy today. One of the best ways that we can stay in front of those leads and be a better teacher, be a better educator, be more helpful, provide better resources is to do exactly that. Um, if you think about when you're a little kid and you're on a car trip, and this was something that like the Simpsons TV show epitomized, but anyone that ever watched um, National Lampoon's Vacation and went on a car trip as a kid can relate to the idea that um, you're sitting in the back seat, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And the sales equivalent is the annoying salesperson who keeps calling up and is totally selfish and wants to know when you're going to buy because he or she only cares about their paycheck. And that's a really, really messed up way of trying to survive and this kind of buyer's journey where people are coming to you so late in the game and have done tons of research because they're not expecting you to be the obnoxious Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross type of salesperson anymore. They're expecting you to be more like a consultative expert. They're expecting you to be more like a thought leader. The way to build up trust is to be a great educator, is to understand what brought them to your door understand what kind of problems they're looking to solve and make sure that you're providing helpful relevant educational content for that. Uh, segmenting your leads by buyer persona 
and giving them content that's unique to that buyer persona is extremely important. The CFO of the financial services company really isn't interested in issues that are relevant to the COO of a media company. So segmentation by persona is critical. Segmenting by where they are in the buyer's journey, the context of where they are in the buyer's journey is extremely important also. If they're still only responding to types of content that appeals to the research stage, pushing them constantly into, are you ready to request a tour? Are you ready to request a quote? Is not going to help your cause. Sure, it's important from time to time to drop that in there, but you'll start to see signals. And this is the argument for making sure that you have the right technology in place so you can understand all of the interactions with your leads. If your data, Colo Data Center still only passes leads to your sales department that gives like first, last company, URL, phone number, on one or two other fields, you're totally tying their hands behind their back. At this stage of the game, they should not only the channel that brought them in, they should know the, the title, the kind of campaign that brought them in, they should be able to see all the blog posts that they read when they come back each visit, they should be able to see all the landing pages they converted on. If you have video integration set up, they should see all the videos you watched. If you're doing webinars like this and you have webinar integration, your salespeople should be able to see all the webinars they've attended. They should be able to see a really, really detailed representation of what their leads have not only told you about themselves explicitly, but the behaviors you observed in how they've interacted with your content on your website. So it's extremely important if you want to be able to bring in more sales to your Colo Data Center that you understand the buyer's journey, the buyer personas, the content, and the context of where they are. Now how can we differentiate our products which are seen as commodities these days? That's an awesome slide. Picture, by the way. Yeah, it's an that's an awesome, awesome slide. You can see it's a picture from uh, a local uh, supermarket, and uh, and you can actually they're a national supermarket, and and it's a, a dairy product manufacturer. And there's two different promotions going on on that shelf. So if the cups of Greek yogurt alone weren't enough of a commodity, on top of that, they're on sale ten for ten dollars this week. And if you scrounge around and find the coupon for every three you buy, you can get another dollar off. So the message here is that if your homepage looks like the data center equivalent of this, you're doing something well, wrong is all in the eye of the beholder and subjective, but there is a much better way if you want to take price off the table as one of the main factors that are going to motivate your, your leads, your prospects decision on whether they ultimately decide to, to go with you or competition. So getting found early, being able to be perceived as a helpful, trusted advisor, providing the educational resources that teaches them on how to evaluate the alternatives on the market is hugely, hugely important to making sure that you never get to the stage where you have to put a price tag and then a coupon and another reduction in front. If your homepage looks like this, um, I don't know what else to tell you except to go back and, and, and think hard about the stuff we're talking about today and how you can make that a reality for your Colo data center so you don't back yourself into this corner. How can we accelerate our data center revenue? How do we accelerate our uh, data center revenue? That, that's a great question. It's important to be mindful of where people are in the journey and feed them content that's appropriate for where they are in the journey. Like for example, as we were talking about before, when you look at the software that people might use to track all of this and you look at the lead intelligence, someone that's poking around a pricing page is one of two things. Either they're a competitor of yours and they're just spying and you should have been able to knock them out really early on in the qualification process and how you segmented those leads and um, how you, you captured basically basic form field kind of stuff, basic contact property kind of stuff. But assuming they're marketing qualified and they're in the right geographic area, they're the right size, if they're poking around your pricing page, they're pretty late stage and they're indicating they're more than likely ready for a, a sales conversation. If they're looking at your contact page, more than likely they're thinking about contacting you, so it's not going to be totally out of, the, out of the blue for you to contact them. If they're looking at your management page and your bios, similar kinds of things. There's certain kind of pages on your website that indicate late stage intent. If they're looking at your services pages, again, kind of late stage intent. If they're reading your helpful educational blog posts, if they're downloading your helpful educational white papers that are designed for people early on in the buyer's journey, they may not be ready for that conversation quite yet and using nurturing by email, using nurturing by social media, 
uh, using nurturing through a format like this, through a webinar, can be very, very helpful to identify the people that are ready to raise their hand and ready to engage at the late stage, and that helps to accelerate your revenue in a really powerful way. Another big technology that's been a lot more useful in the last couple of years is real-time notifications. So when someone is a lead on your website and they revisit your website, you should be able to have software that is able to notify in real time your sales professionals that one of your leads is back on your website and tell them specifically what kind of content they're engaging with because as long as you make sure that you don't go over into the creepy territory just being able to reach out and saying hey Bob it's been a while since we talked just wanted to touch base and see if you're still working on that problem that we discussed back on on last month on the fifth uh, give me a shout if you need any help number is blah blah you know so that can make an enormous enormous difference so our next question uh, actually takes up two slides here and uh, a little bit about what we talked about earlier with uh, small color providers competing with the larger color providers. Based on our relatively small physical size in comparison to big box data centers, many decision makers are unwilling to consider our solutions, even though we possess capabilities and capacities well beyond what the larger companies can provide. How do we get decision makers to buy into the big fish in a small pond mentality and attention to detail that our growing roster of completely satisfied customers currently enjoy? Yeah, that is a long and detailed question, but it's a very, it's a question that we saw lots of signs of throughout these FAQs, and this isn't just a competitive intelligence issue. This is an issue of understanding your buyer personas better than anyone else on the planet does, and executing a plan based on that. Because once you understand who the two or three or four or five different people are that you're really trying to reach. Look at who else is trying to reach them and do the basic test that we talked about earlier on in this webinar. When you go to their home pages, are they talking about themselves? Are they being really egotistical? Are they really being very salesy? Are they really being self-promotional? Or are they providing helpful educational thought leadership resource type of content? Are they trying to be perceived more as salespeople, corporate sterile kind of salespeople, big box? Or are they trying to be perceived as professors, as advisors, as subject matter experts? That can make an enormous, enormous difference to competing effectively with the big fish and the, the be the big fish in the small pond and positioning yourself in a way that the big box simply isn't. Now, how can we land bigger data center deals in top markets? To get the bigger data center deals in top markets, first you need to identify what those top markets are, and they're going to vary depending on whether you're local, regional, or national. In the data center industry, like Northern California, Dallas, Chicago, Northern Virginia, um, New York, you know, there's five or six core big markets, and there's a lot of secondary markets. So, you know, it's going to vary depending on where you are specifically. But when you're doing your buyer persona research, there's going to be things that come up that are geo-specific. There's going to be certain conferences they go to that are unique to where they're located. There's going to be certain LinkedIn groups that they hang out that are specific and unique to where they're located. There may be certain things they're talking about on, on Twitter. There may be certain things that they tend to search for. And by creating hyper-relevant content, uh, you know, you're not necessarily looking to create content that's going to attract thousands or tens of thousands of leads in these niches, in these buyer personas. You're looking to attract the ones that are most likely to create sales opportunities and sales opportunities that materialize into revenue. Having tons of visitors on your website shouldn't be the goal. Having tons of leads generated on your website shouldn't be the goal. They need to be marketing qualified leads. They need to be marketing qualified leads with a very high likelihood and a, a significant percentage going to sales ready and a significant percentage of those sales ready leads going to opportunities and a significant amount of those opportunities progressing on to being profitable clients. Unprofitable clients isn't the goal. All too often when we do workshops for Colo data centers we hear the frustration that their client roster currently uh, there's a lot of bad words they throw around with how they feel about their client roster but the number one is their money losing deals. Uh, they end up discounting like crazy, they back themselves into a corner, and they end up accidentally becoming a nonprofit on a segment of your client list. You don't want to do that. You want to make sure that you're focusing on profitable clients, but the bigger clients and top markets comes down to really, really understanding those buyer personas and doing a fantastic job creating and distributing content that is helpful for them and, and, the, and their own eyes. This is our last question in the close phase of the buyer's journey. How should we support our direct data center sales team with lead tracking. 
I think uh, having a CRM is essential. The CRM needs to be integrated with your marketing software, and you need to use something called closed loop reporting. Closed loop reporting. Closed loop reporting ties sales results to marketing activities. So when a contact gets converted from um, opportunity into client that goes back and it highlights everything from initially all along the full conversion path all along the full buyer's journey that contributed to that revenue so your software needs to be able to provide that kind of detail because again the visitors eh, the leads eh, you know it kind of sort of helps but the reality is we want the visitors the leads the the qualified leads the sales ready leads the opportunities we want all of those that lead to revenue and the right kind of revenue and the better idea we have on the specifics on what leads to the right kind of revenue the more we can focus on what works really well and stop doing the stuff that doesn't now we're going to uh, move into our last phase of the buyer's journey this is the delight phase where we take our clients and we turn them into promoters of our business. So our first question here is, is Colo dead? With everyone thinking cloud, is Colo no longer viable? Why do I get the feeling that the person that submitted this question works for a company that only sells cloud services? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you look at the market share numbers, what I see about a week or two ago that Amazon, Rackspace, Google, and IBM are controlling something like a little more than half of the, uh, the cloud market. So, you know, there's definitely consolidation that's going on. The reality is uh, cloud is actually fueling a tremendous amount of growth in the Colo space. All the security breaches are, are fueling a tremendous amount of growth in the Colo space. The cost of power, um, the cost of cooling, the cost of staff, the scarcity of staff, all of those are fueling a, a lot of growth in the data center space, a lot of growth in the Colo space. I'm not a research analyst. You know, there's certainly research firms that, that spend um, tens of thousands of hours a year on, on crunching these numbers and give you much more specifics, but the general trend that we see is the colo market is still extremely healthy. It's extremely fragmented. Absolutely, there's going to continue to be consolidation. There's been a lot of M&A activity going on in the colo space this year. We expect that to continue. Is the market no longer viable? Heck no. It's healthier than it's ever been. From a gross revenue perspective, is there going to be margin pressure? Absolutely, because there's a lot of people running around out there putting the 10 for $10 thing in the buy buy three, get $10 off kind of thing on their website. And the sooner you get people in the sales process, the sooner you intercept them with the thought leadership, the more you can explain your unique value prop and don't have to resort to price discounting. So Josh, what are the best strategies for growing revenue in the colo space? I think the most important thing is to think leverage. If you think about putting a certain amount of monthly or annual budget into advertising, like pay-per-click advertising or something like that, once your budget is gone, that's the end of that traffic, and hopefully you had some good converting landing pages that generated leads, otherwise that's it. It's like walking out of a trade show, and you know there may be a small percentage of people who took the program with them who eventually get to page 71 in the program where your company is listed and eventually get to your website, but the cool part with creating blogs and creating reach on social media and creating videos and podcasts and webinars and things like that is as long as the content is reasonably evergreen if a blog is converting to leads and a landing page is converting to leads until that content stops being relevant stops being evergreen if it's working this month there's every reason to believe that a significant percentage of that will continue to work six months a year two years out Now, 70 or 80 percent of what's generating leads on our website and on our clients website is typically content that was not created that month let me repeat that because that's a hugely, hugely important mindset shift. Mindset shift. 70 or 80 percent of what's creating leads for us and creating leads for our clients in a given month is coming from content that was created in previous months. So there's a huge amount of leverage that gets created over time by getting to the point that you have a couple hundred blog posts and a couple dozen well-converting landing pages. So how should we deal with budgetary constraints when trying to grow our data center revenue? Is it really a budgetary issue? Is it really about the money or is it about the ROI? The reality is if you're able to show a detailed funnel with detailed metrics and detailed SMART goals about what you're going to be looking to do in the attract phase and the convert phase and the close phase and how that maps to historical close rates and what you're going to be doing to look to drive more visitors, when you're able to show just going into a simple keyword tool about uh, how many searches there are in a given month when you're able to look at your competitors side by side that are getting a lot more traffic than you and see how many more pages of index content they have how much more social reach they have how much better they are perceived how much link how much authority they have in Google's eyes that, that makes them a lot more apt to rank across the board on content it really isn't about budget is it it's more about return on investment so change the discussion whenever possible 
about what you're dealing with with your senior management to focus on ROI projections and smart goals and data as opposed to budget. Because if you just focus on looking at your uh, strategy investments going forward, looking at through the lens of declining trade shows or declining print ads or declining yields from cold calls, it's like the idea of zero-based budgeting versus historical budgeting. It's not really the right mindset. So be thinking of smart goals, be thinking of return on investment, and be thinking of all the interim metrics that you can show that you're on the right track. This is a long-term game. This isn't about putting a couple blog posts up and you're going to have revenue tomorrow. It definitely takes a while to build up the traction, but it's extremely, extremely important if your company wants to remain competitive in this space where as much as 80 or 90 percent of the journey is going to be over in a year or two before people are ready to talk to you. So the question is, do you want to have a presence in that first 80 or 90 percent, or does your company want to be completely invisible and not relevant? How should we go about channel management when growing a data center? Yeah, I think we're coming down the home stretch, Dennis. It's the last that is the last question. Last question we have. So yeah, we got one question about building a channel partner program. And what a lot of people don't realize is if you're trying to attract a certain kind of reseller, if you're trying to attract a certain kind of VAR, and we've had a number of conversations like this with clients and prospective clients in the last couple of months, it's just another buyer persona. Because the VARs you're not, you're not looking to attract all 160,000 SMB VARs in the U.S. or you know, if you talk to Microsoft at one point, if you talk to some, they have hundreds of thousands in, in their ecosystem. It, it's too broad a net for most of you to cast. So you need to be super specific about who are the specific kinds of channel partners that you want to attract. What are they worried about? What are their goals, their challenges? What are they searching for online? Where do they hang out online? Where do they hang out offline? What are the things that can get them a promotion? What are the things that can get them fired? In other words, what are the things that can get them new clients? What are the things that can get them kicked out of new clients? Once you understand all of those issues and create hyper-relevant content that helps them solve those problems, content in the form of blog posts, screencasts, videos, podcasts, ebooks, white papers, checklists, content that helps you teach them how to be a better VAR, how to be a better channel partner. Um, that goes even because early on they're not looking for your channel program. They're just looking for advice on how to solve a specific problem in their reseller, in their VAR, in their MSP organization. If you can be perceived as a teacher, as a trusted advisor, as a subject matter expert, as a thought leader, it builds up that trust and that's an extremely important prerequisite to getting them excited about joining your, your partner program. That delight phase the, at the end there, delight, is extremely critical because getting them signed on as a partner is only half the battle. You need to make sure that you have the right enablement strategies in place to teach them, how, you're basically teaching them how to sell through. You know, it's not about selling them, it's teaching them how to do what your sales team is able to do on a more independent channel partner basis. Hey there, it's Joshua Feinberg from SB Home Run. We're so glad that you stopped by to watch this video today. If you got good value, make sure that you hit the like button, subscribe and hit the bell notification so you can get notified when new videos just like this go live. Thanks, we hope you're having a great day and we wish you great success.